Well, good morning. Uh, thanks for the uh, interrupt uh, uh, after this going around. I just want to talk really quick about an opportunity we have to help patients that has recurrent pericarditis. We have a phase two trial looking at this. And again, I'm the contact person and also Christine Majewski. You guys email us, epic, call, text, whatever you, uh, you would like. And I'll go through a couple other slides, but this is an open label phase two pilot study. We're looking at this uh, particular uh, 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 medication, which I'll again talk a little bit more in the, in the next couple of slides, for patients who have symptomatic recurrent pericarditis. Not a first episode, but recurrent episode. Again, they have to have more than one recurrent episode. They have to be symptomatic at the time of uh, enrollment. The CRP has to be elevated, and they have to be on old on stable pericarditis medication at the time. Now, if you have any questions, just email us. We want to cast the net really wide. So again, if you have questions, just give the patient to us and then we will sort it out. This is sponsored uh, by Kinexa Pharmaceuticals. Now, it is what we call KPL914, and it's a interleukin-1 trap. So it's a, a dimeric fusion protein, which has two components. It's a ligand that binds, it's a binding domain um, of a human interleukin-1 receptor, and also an interleukin-1 receptor accessory protein. And that's kind of linked to the FC portion of the human IgG. So it blocks interleukin-1 signaling. So it's, a, it's basically a decoy uh, that traps interleukin-1 alpha and also interleukin-1 beta. And I know most of you guys know it is a cytokine that drives the pathophysiology behind a lot of inflammatory processes. And we know it plays a significant role in patients who have pericarditis. And part of that is because they have aspirated pericardial effusions and they have found high levels of interleukin-1. Now, this particular compound is approved as step in the treatment of, I, I got to get this right, cryptopyrin-associated periodic syndrome. Basically, this is a condition where they have overwhelming production of interleukin-1. These are relatively rare conditions. Now, the way we'll do the study is, again, I said this is a phase two open label study. So we're trying to recruit 10 patients or so. Uh, there's opportunity to recruit more, depending on how things go. Um, this is a subcutaneous injection. Uh, all the studies, uh, will obviously be done through here. The, the drug will be shipped to the patient. Uh, one of the things that is a great opportunity for us is that all the patients will have a cardiac MRI as a way to assess uh, for pericardial inflammation. And as many of you guys know, uh, one of the ways to approach that is to what we call STIR or t 2 weight imaging. And also we give contrast to see whether it's post-contrast delay enhancement. So again, this is an opportunity not only to help patients who have recurrent pericarditis, who often run other options other than uh, prolonged doses of steroids with very, very slow taper and have recurrent issues, either side effects or recurrent uh, symptoms. But this is also a good opportunity for us uh, to look at uh, uh, how MRI will really facilitate in patients who have these more complicated cases uh, of pericarditis. Uh, the objectives of this phase two study is obviously looking at, again, uh, the inter and intra-subject variability based on the CRP level. Uh, we, again, looking at symptoms based on an objective scale. Uh, the secondary objective is to look at the time to course improvement uh, in terms of using the pericarditis parameters and also to evaluate safety or any adverse side effects uh, of this medication. And again, I think this is a wonderful opportunity that we have to help these patients, again, where they often have uh, limited uh, other options in terms of symptomatic uh, improvement. All right, thank you very much. My compliments to David Lynn here for being the uh, co-PI on this national study. We're really at the cusp of using uh, anti-inflammatory drugs in the cardiovascular arena, and I think this puts us uh, on the map of uh, institutions that are able to carry out this level of research. So thanks, David, for doing that. Uh, this morning, Grand Rounds, it's my privilege and honor to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Ash Tamini, who started uh, his first day with me out in Waconia in August of 2016. It was a, I learned a lot. He helped me uh, 
with a TE on a patient with a complex mitral valve, uh, paravalvar leak, and I was immediately impressed with his personality and his knowledge. ASH is a product of Addis Ababa University Medical School, and he, where he met his wife. He came to California after that, and to show how smart he is, they convinced him he should go to Minnesota, uh, where all the medicine is practiced, and so he did that and finished his residency and uh, cardiology training at the U and uh, was appropriately hired on by the U because of his skills. And we hired him away from the U two years ago, or in 2016. And um, I know Mark Pritzker called us when that happened and was wildly complaining about us stealing the best talent from the U. So um, Ash has made a wonderful contribution to the group and also to the Waconia practice. And uh, it's, pre it's a privilege to have you present Grand Rounds this morning. Everybody hear me? Good. Thank you, Dr. Sharkey, for the kind uh, introduction. So, um, thank you for you know everybody for coming. First off, no disclosures, nothing, no conflicts of interest uh, to to. But I'm involved in um, at one point or another caring for the patients, the cases that we're going to uh, discuss today. So we're going to start out our, uh, our case, our first case, with a 46-year-old male uh, construction worker who was uh, referred for an echocardiogram. Just a little bit of background story. Uh, he had a prior history of type A or T dissection. He had a debate type 2, extending, uh, limited to the DSN aorta. He underwent repair with a hemoshield graft uh, with preservation of the root. He has history of hypertension on pharmacotherapy, and um, he presented with three months history of chest pain. <coughs> and the chest pain, a global sensation sometimes when he swallows, there is a lump in his throat. Uh, no known family history of genetic syndromes, um, uh, aortic syndromes or genetic disorders like Marfan's or anything like that. So this is uh, the echocardiogram. You know, anybody chime in, I don't want to pick on anyone. David, I'm seeing you here, so it would be easy to pick on you. But uh, so just give me interpretation of what you're seeing here. So the root is there, David. Uh, right. uh, it, there's no doubt yet. And then. Uh, Good. So parastinal long, as you said, big wide root. Next picture. Just to exp I have a lot of a lot of images and all that. So to expedite, I'll I'll just talk through. Sometimes I may ask uh, Dr. Lin to kind of chime in, and uh, uh, Dr. Newell too here, uh, because I have a lot of advanced imaging uh, 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 images, CT and MRI. So this is an echo, of course, and this is the root. You can see there is something abnormal here. This is not the usual way you'd see in a normal uh, um, uh, repaired route. You can clearly see the graft here, but there is, there is something here, right? So dilated, uh, pretty much dilated uh, aortic, aortic route. Next picture, color. The color <coughs> really does not, you know, it is not, too, you know, it, is, it, it does not flow through. It does not come out. You don't see it leaking or uh, getting away from um, the constraints of the root. Color compare, similar, uh, similar pictures. You can see that dilated root, and there is something, there is some nuisance here that would be a little bit troubling uh, for, for anyone who would be seeing it. Then higher up in the ascending aorta, you can clearly see the graft. And then normal flow through the graft. No flow, you can see in the uh, 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 neighboring area. So the echo conclusions were, yes, dilated root um, at the sinuses measuring about uh, 5.9 centimeters, and the recommendation was um, uh, CTA for further evaluation. 
And the patient was referred uh, to our clinic um, after a CT angiogram. And uh, if I may ask uh, Dr. Noor if you can comment uh, on these images. Sure. Um, this is more of an, uh, looks like an arch view. Um, this actually looks reasonably okay. Uh, that does not. Um, <laughs> So obviously at the level of the PA bifurcation, so the structure on the right is the pulmonary artery as it bifurcates. On the left is the aorta. See the contrast really lighting up the lumen um, and really pronounced uh, fluid around the aorta. Um, you know, let's see if you guys check the density of a particular area. Just visually this looks like inflammatory fluid and, and not necessarily like thrombus. Uh, but that's substantial for the ascending aorta even in somebody that's been repaired. Um, on the far right is a three-dimensional reconstruction of the CT images. Um, you can tell how large the root looks when it looks like the heart. That's actually still the root right there. Um, and you can see the part that's been repaired. Just above that, you can see the post-surgical changes there. But again, if you go to the far left, you can actually see all that darker gray outside of the lumen of the aorta is not supposed to be there. That's all inflammatory fluid the way it looks. Um, another set of images here, uh, again, showing, I think most importantly, two things. One is that the root is uh, dramatically enlarged, and secondly, that there's a lot of uh, periaortic fluid that is presumed to be inflammatory. Um, you see some more, more typical post-surgical changes in the mid-ascending aorta. That's the part that's been repaired before, but the root was not repaired before based on these images. And substantial enlargement. Uh, when you look in the lumen on the right, you're almost to um, six centimeters. When you include the periodic fluid, again, you're, you're uh, dramatically enlarged. Uh, the question, I guess, would be, is there anything truly acute? Um, you know, I don't see a dissection flap. Some of the white structures you see on the right picture are actually the post-surgical uh, structures. Uh, that being said, again, with the symptoms of Lump in his throat, it's actually moving the PA a little bit laterally. Um, this is something you wouldn't want to ignore. Excellent. Thank you so much. So the conclusion, as uh, you heard, um, nothing dissimilar. Significantly dilated um, aortic root. Uh, moderate amount of mixed attenuation fluid. This is what was, we were talking about. And uh, no definitive evidence of exacerbation, but uh, a, late, a delayed phase image was not done. So um, maybe uh, some limitations because of that. So what would you do? Uh, urgent referral to CV surgery clinic as an outpatient basis. Call Dr. Harris Sapp. I don't know whether he's around here. Uh, direct hospital admission or uh, tell the patient to take it easy and relax. So any of these, if you did, I think it would be okay. Uh, what ended up happening was uh, we admitted the patient, and we, it, it so happens that it was Dr. Harris who was um, available for consult, so it kind of worked out fine. So to kind of bring the point here, symptomatic ascending aortic aneurysm, there is no hard data, but when they are considered to be symptomatic, it is best to, um, to uh, do an urgent repair. So urgent is a qualitative term. Urgent is urgently referred to a CV surgery clinic, so that, that can happen. Or um, urgent, urgent admission to, um, to the hospital, so that it can, be, it, can, it can be taken care of as soon as possible. Aortic aneurysm, mostly it is uh, asymptomatic until it becomes catastrophic with aortic syndromes. You can see all these um, uh, types of symptoms, <laughs> dyspnea, dysphagia, when it's compressing the local structures. This is a case probably the biggest 14.8 centimeters ascending aorta uh, prior to rupture, both the uh, descending and also the ascending uh, aorta in an uh, 85-year-old lady. So the patient was admitted to Abbott. Uh, he was seen by CV surgery, cardiology consultation. And then urgent repair was, of course, recommended. But one of the things that, unfortunately, there are no intra pictures taken, but this was the description. 
a large abscess cavity when entering the chest. The tube graft was completely surrounded by purulent fluid. So this is something that you really would not expect. So, uh, you know, uh, the fluid around the uh, graft that we were seeing earlier in the pictures uh, was puffed. So the pus was irrigated, evacuated with anti, uh, you know, antimicrobial solution um, and, and iodine, diluted iodine. At that time, the plan was to use a homograph to fix it, but it was not available and it was going to take long, so the patient uh, was uh, taken back to the ICU. So, of course, infectious disease were consulted. Uh, the patient was started on broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, he eventually, three days later, underwent dental procedure, um, primarily because if this was going to be a graft and the patient being young, I mean a homograft, the patient being young, there could be um, another potential for reoperation. That was the reason given. And um, um, all the cultures, including the tissue culture, came back negative and actually on discharge, he was discharged without, without antibiotics. So this is his three month post of CTA. And again, you can see those things. And um, I don't know, is there another CT? person or is it all, all Dr. Nolong? Okay, if you can comment, is this something you typically see in a three month post-op CT after a repair? No, I actually did uh, after, yeah, after I read this, because um, uh, Kevin Harris was in clinic and I believe it ordered it for follow-up. And so I called him because this is, uh, again, a lot more than you'd expect. Um, the good news is that the root looks excellent and the lumen looks excellent. And so, you know, the repair looks intact. So three months is usually enough time where all of the post-surgical inflammatory changes improve. Um, that, there wasn't anything acute. It was just more, you know, more um, fluid there than I would expect. Thank you. So I just wanted to briefly talk about anatomy of the aortic graft, not, not um, uh, too detailed. These are the inter interposition graphs. The interposition graphs are the ones that we use commonly where you have the synthetic material getting attached to the native um, um, uh, structures. Inclusion graphs, we don't do that, those anymore <laughs> where the aorta is surrounded by the, um, um, uh, um, uh, by the, by, by the uh, prosthetic material. The reason why I wanted to kind of mention this is earlier you can see on the CT scan that there are materials, for example, of a felt where it kind of circumscribe the area where the uh, graft attaches to um, uh, the native aortic tissue that is reinforced by a Teflon, a Teflon um, um, a string or fiber. And this is what it looks like on a, a non-enhanced non CT and on contrast CT. Of course, uh, you can clearly see that here uh, in its um, uh, cross section. It would be important because sometimes it can be uh, confused with pseudoaneurysms. Sometimes it could be a reason why uh, patients may develop supraannular um, um, uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, Long-term complications of um, standing aorta, uh, all of us know this. Um, uh, there are a lot in terms of uh, complications, but primarily aneurysmal disease progression, dilation, and formation of um, pseudoaneurysm. And because of this, these are the guideline recommendations, especially for aortic dissection, where you commonly um, end up imaging people, especially in the first year and then yearly after that. Uh, mostly nowadays, MR recommended uh, to reduce the, the uh, radiation exposure plus contrast. Um, there is a, a protocol that the uh, Duke group has put out uh, recent that they would be um, uh, frequently imaging their, their patients, especially after aortic dissection repair. But after it is stable, they tend to uh, lengthen, uh, lengthen the duration. This is based on their experience in about uh, uh, 900 uh, patients. Uh, with that, I will, uh, unless you have any questions, please. So, <laughs> I guess I'm still at a loss. Do you think that reaction is something? Is that a, is there some type of, I, I simply remember seeing this. Is, is he reacting to some type of material? So difficult to say. One thing I'll tell you is 
He had a 2010 CT scan, which I was not able to get the images of, but the report says there is the same material, I mean, uh, fluid um, um, uh, surrounding the stuff, whether that is, um, you know, allergic reaction to the material that has been, called, you know, creating sterile abscess, uh, whether he has, he does not have any in infectious symptoms at all. He is a healthy guy, uh, does um, uh, some construction work. Uh, but uh, no infectious symptoms, no inflammatory symptoms at all. So I am, I am honestly at loss to, to kind of explain that. Ash, did you, uh, did you go back and uh, look at where that vaccine actually originated? Yeah, very first, uh, when it first presented and how they represented that theory about because the uh, striking thing was the so unfortunately, it is done in 2004. I did not have the details. When you look at the root that way, it almost makes you think that he has some genetic, you know, underlying familial disorder. No history of familial syndromes, and he was not inclined to, um, uh, to do the genetic testing. I don't know why that specific procedure was was chosen for the initial repair. Yeah. But, but I mean, it doesn't look like it was repaired. It doesn't look like the group was repaired. No. Was no, that the report. That's what they say on the report. But, but on the city, I guess when I, it looks like when you look, you look at it, at an ST junction, and all you have is a tube graft. It doesn't even look like the, uh, there was any intervention at the group. Because, well, the CT scan shows that something had been done here. The, the root did not look like it was in, it looked like there was a root bearing procedure, and because the root just doesn't do that. Big after you repair it. Usually, I mean, you see post surgical changes at the level of the root. It's tough, actually, even with the CT scan to tell whether the valve has been intervened upon unless it's. Well, you can usually see a stent structure if it's bioprosthetic, or you can see the mechanical bioprosthesis. But if they're putting the native valve, um, you know, resuspending it, it's sometimes tougher to tell for sure. So, so can we go back. I'll, I'll show you, but at least reading the current of. Um, so what is the. What is the uh, There's nothing. The person would be able to better address it. But I would think if they, you know, if at the time the root was enlarged, if at the time of the operation the root was enlarged, and then you can find it to the valve, stop a graft right into the root and you suspend the valve. And at that time, they already have to find the point. The only thing I would say about that is, at least reading Dr. <coughs> Askew's note of, of note, he mentions that the aortic valve is already repaired. There is a suture there in the native aortic valve itself. So they, they have done something, some repair to it um, at the time of maybe he has had like um, aortic insufficiency or, or something like that. There was something done to the valve and at least based on the description, what I understood was, uh, you know, it cannot be repaired, of course. Um, and he just, there was a suture material there uh, in the, on the aortic valve that, and it looked repaired. But, but to your point, Ash, I think, um, you know, the fact that it's 5.8 at the root now, if that, that were even higher than 4.5 in 2004, odds are it would have been repaired. So I think that, you know, you're probably right. But it sounds like that you're going to see that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So second case, uh, an urgent bedside cardiology consult uh, paged out uh, to see a 78-year-old uh, Somali male with chest pain. Kind of tough to communicate a little bit um, uh, because of uh, language limitations. Uh, he, but he was able to describe that he has had a three, four days history of um, um, uh, left anterior chest pain. And no correlation with physical activity. Mildly elevated serum troponin level. Of course, um, ECG and SAT echo were ordered uh, to further evaluate. Uh, background past medical history, of course, um, you know, a little bit complicated. He had a recent thyroid hemorrhage, which was treated um, 
conservatively that he sustained after a fall accident. Actually, the reason that he came in for is because of dark stool pain that drove him hemoglobin. Uh, he has long-standing history of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so this is um, his uh, ECG. Good volunteer. So, uh, normal thing is the in before there. Uh, and to help you, this is the prior one, which you don't see much on this one. Maybe this is still there. So yeah, definitely looks different. There's more pronounced as the elevation here uh, in, in those leaves. Okay. There's no PR depression. All right. So I'll... Um, Move on to the echo images. So, Lynn, do you mind? Sure. I've been kind of cheating a little bit because I think we talked about this case before. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, a, a significant size pericardial effusion anteriorly, you can see. Um, otherwise, the LV function is normal. There's a little, I think that's a very, very tiny uh, diastolic inversion of the. Yeah, of it would be. So, again, you can see the relatively good size pericardial effusion. So uh, this is the MO, and Ash is trying to help me out there. So you can see this. Uh, <laughs> so. The same thing here on this one. So again, four chamber view. So you know, it, uh, you look at that. That's a hemodynamically significant pericardial effusion. So. so you can see that it's partially shift. Um, yeah. It's not always, but you can you can see. And, and this is IBC the, dilated again, consistent with that. All right. So dilated IBC, large pericardial effusion um, uh, with some early diastolic RV invagination. Uh, so plan, start anti-inflammatory medications and treat for acute uh, pericarditis. Send them to the cath lab for a tap. Uh, just tell the internal medicine team no further evaluation is required. And do you want to see more images? Dr. Lin or somebody else? Well, I learned. If more images is an option, you always pick. Uh, get more in. Yeah. Get more text. It would not be fair. So, I, I, yes, we have looked at it. It would not be fair. So, I, I don't want to pick on somebody who, who does not have not seen it. But the thing is, this is this is what troubled me. You know, I was at the bedside looking at this echo. If I had not known anything about the patient out of state, this patient was grafted before. So he has had a graft. So you can see clearly this line. This is the semi aorta, of course, double lined. And you can see that. It does not really look like a dissection plaque. There is no, uh, you know, independent motion and things like that. And then this is, there is the color. On the color, you can see some AI here. But nothing flows through that, uh, through that gap there. So double, double lumen probably. And then more pictures, kind of comparing, uh, telling the same story. And then even further down, same story. So the echo conclusions were, of course, we saw a moderate to large pericardial effusion. Um, uh, you know, LV function is okay. There's nothing that would suggest that the patient is having a, a myocardial infarction or anything like that, an acute Crohn syndrome. It looks like pericarditis based on the ECG and the clinical history. But that um, aortic, um, that semi-aortic, a uh, particular appearance is uh, uh, troubling. So I think what happened after this, it would not even be um, um, an next step choice, uh, was um, because the clinically he sounded more like acute pericarditis than anything. And we were able to convince ourselves that maybe this could be an artifact, a side lobe artifact that could have created uh, the semi-aortic picture. The patient was sent for uh, pericardial synthesis to the cath lab the next day. 
The next day, this is what happened. He was not tapped. This is 12 hours after the initial, after the initial um, um, echo. So you can see that it does not look as prominent, the effusion. And I'll even go further. Yes, there is some, but the invagination of the RV that we saw earlier is not as impressive as it was before. And there is more, more importantly, there is not a lot of cushion, you know, a fluid or a window to put a, a needle in past it. We went ahead and further got more images and the same troubling aortic picture. So, I mean, we discussed, you know, these are one of the things that you'd agonize about, but finally we end up doing a stat um, a chest CTA. So I just wanted to, before I go and discuss about the chest CTA results, what is the differential diagnosis for this? So if you have to go through and look at it, you know, if you think this is a dissection, then there are some things that you'd expect, things like random mobility, which it really did not have. Things like um, 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 density, the density it has, it has similar density. It was, it was, it did not really um, um, thin out, uh, you know, uh, within its course. Then it should, you know, um, uh, constrain color flow if there is a flop, which it seems to do. But most often for me, it kind of looked um, uh, looked a side lobe artifact could be, but some form of weird aortic calcification also that could have been. That being said, after the CT was done, of course, there was a stat page out for the consult team, myself, and the surgeon. And the first cut, uh, Dr. Newell, if you can help. So um, <clears throat> on the left, you see um, the left ventricle has the, the more dense contrast, that's the brighter, and then on the left side of this picture is the right ventricle. Um, and then you see a little bit of darker space there, which is actually the pericardial fat, and then outside of that is all pericardial fluid. So that's what fluid looks like on a CT. Um, measured on the left there is the IVC, which actually by CT measurements is, is okay. We go up to 25 on CT. Um, we always do non-contrast images if we're concerned for um, uh, ulcer or penetrating ulcer, things like that. Um, if you go back just one, one slide there, Ash. So if you look on the left um, picture of these three here, certainly we see ascending aortic calcification, which is always of concern. It's, it's not certainly not as common as arch or descending thoracic aortic calcification. I think the left picture is the only one that's real concerning in that you see some calcification inside of what looks like the full lumen, although it's tough to say in a non-contrast scan. Uh, so if you go forward to the contrast images, I think much more concerning, especially in the left picture, for a potential dissection flap. Also in the central picture, you can see that the, um, the atherosclerotic change, the ascending aortic, again, is, is uncommon to be this bad. Um, and it looks potentially like a flap there in the central picture there that's, that's headed up. And also you see it again on the right. Could that be just atherosclerotic change? Sure, um, given the clinical scenario and the the fact that there's calcification right there, which could be a start point of a dissection, that makes you more and more suspicious, which I think is why you got the stat page. Yeah. And more pictures? Yeah, so you see, again, what we see on the arch and on the descending thoracic aorta is uh, not uncommon, and that you see a lot of irregular atheromatous change and calcification. It's much more unusual to see it in the ascending portion, so again, making him higher risk for an acute aortic syndrome. Um, uh, arch vessel anatomy looks okay there, so nothing worrisome there. All right. So the conclusions were it was read as type A or T dissection with anterior and posterior flaps. Um, and at least based on Hounsett's unit, I'm assuming that is, um, instead of being that a simple effusion, it looked like um, a blood, and there could even be communication uh, with the effusion. So now, hindsight being 2020, um, one of the things that at least I've learned um, uh, during fellowship um, is, you know, how, how common, um, I did not honestly believe that pericardial pathologies are that common until I started preparing for, for this. 
what would you think? What is, how common is pericardial pathology uh, in acute type A, uh, type A dysfunction? It is, it is quite a bit. According to the uh, 2010 um, ACC um, AHA guidelines, about a third of patients would have it. About, of course, 10% of them would tamponade, and most often that could be the cause of days. And uh, mostly it is translation of fluid that is in contact with the adjacent pericardium uh, that creates a very small hemodynamically insignificant pericardial effusion. But of course, if, you, if the dissection ruptured in the pericardial space, uh, that, is, that, is, uh, uh, that is an issue. And the other question is, do we tap it or do we not tap it? So we have always, that is the other thing that we've all, you know, I've always learned. You don't put a needle in the pericardial space, even if it is tamponade, if it was related to um, aortic dissection. So I went ahead and did, did some search. So the earlier report, five cases, six cases, anybody, even when in tamponade, when you try to tap it, people die. But there are more recent cases where, yes, if people are in shock and as a bridge to um, until repair, uh, there is a, a controlled pericardial synthesis that you can do. And actually, in the European Pericardial Disease Guidelines, it is given, of course, a level of evidence C, it is expert opinion. It is given a class three indication to um, uh, attempt um, uh, controlled pericardial drainage. And essentially, this is primarily pushed by a group in, in Japan. And the thought behind that is usually this is an acute um, effusion, and you are in this kind of very steep pressure volume curve. You don't have any space. Blood is accumulating. So if you remove a little bit of fluid here, it can make a big change in terms of the pressure. And this is one of the cases that was um, um, uh, put in, in, in third. You can clearly see this is a radial arterial pulse, shock. So they put in the needle, usually 5, 10 cc's at a time. They use about a 5, 10 cc needle. And this is when it was done, and this is the blood pressure improving with that. So yes, it is not, the, um, you know, it, it is considered to be a bridge until you get them to surgery. It still can be attempted. Um, I don't know, Dr. Travers, is, is, do we have an experience here about uh, doing this in a moribund patient, a hypersensitive tamponade with aortic dissection? Well, I can say that I personally have never done it in this situation. So I don't know if any of my other partners are here, but um, I, think it's, I think it is our experience. It's probably rare to not be doing that. Then these are the intraoperative uh, findings. I uh, personally talked to Dr. Flavin about this. This is it. Severe bread and butter pericarditis. That's what it looks like. No evidence of hemorrhagic pericardial effusion. Extensive atheromatous ulceration in the ascending aorta, as well as the aortic arch. No dissection flap. It just looks maybe a penetrated ulcer or just very bad atherosclerotic disease involving the ascending aorta, as uh, Mark was saying earlier, which you don't see commonly. Maybe the patient's long-standing history of uh, rheumatoid arthritis may have contributed. His CT evidence did not, I mean, his CT scan did not really suggest that it was uh, aortitis or a vasculitic uh, picture. So that was repaired um, um, uh, with graft. Um, and the patient did well, was discharged, but um, eventually did not do well. He came back with pneumonia um, and um, uh, passed away from that. Any questions? Yeah. I think that's a great case, Ash, and I think, you know, obviously a challenge, challenging case. I was struck by the change in his pericardial effusion from day one to day two and the fact that it got smaller, which I wouldn't have expected if this was attributable to a dissection with kind of this continuous leak across a, a small lumen. So I was just kind of curious about your thoughts in hindsight about whether that you look back at that change in effusion and think, does that change our perspective in terms, obviously the imaging is going to drive you in terms of you found this concern or dissection flap, you're not going to just negate that, but that's, that's the one 
Let me show you the so the CT and the echo. So I'm not sure whether the positioning that we had the patient on when we are doing the tap, attempting the tap in the cath lab. Uh, I'm not sure whether it mattered or not because the CT still shows quite a bit of diffusion. Uh, it is not gone. Uh, maybe he would have, he did not get diuresis or anything like that. We did not do that, those things in, in the time in, in, in between. So I really don't have a, a, a good a good um, 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 explanation. I guess the, uh, the, the flip side of that is uh, even if the imaging position change, the hemodynamic significance of it shouldn't change, right? So like it's not as if, if you change the position of the patient so the fluid moves to a different position, it's still compressing the pericardium in the same way. So I guess the fact that you're not seeing evidence of hemodynamic change suggests to me that it actually did get smaller. Assuming both studies are equivalent. Right, right. Yeah. I agree. So a couple of things that I was thinking about as you were presenting this. So if you look outside of this country and set up with an immigrant, one of the most common causes of pericarditis outside this country is tuberculosis. Yeah. I wonder if you thought about that. The other thing I always remember Dr. Edwards or how we say the H in the aorta is somewhat immune to atherosclerotic change. However, simplest causes calcification in extensive proximal or ascending aortic lesion under the cusata. Yes, so syphilis, yes, the, the, the third stage syphilis, the gummas that you see, like late 20 plus years after, they usually present with aneurysm of some sort. In, in each case, the difference is the aortic size was not that big. I think 3.8, that was the maximum diameter that he had. So he does not have the big, you know, uh, long, you know, long-term syphilitic change that you, you'd expect. Uh, with respect to the um, um, tuberculous pericarditis, I'm going to be honest with you, it just sounded, the presentation sounded very accurate with the ECG change. It kind of more matched with acute pericarditis. And we did not see the typical calcifications that we'd expect with tuberculous pericarditis. Usually it is a chronic process you'd end up seeing a lot of pericardial uh, calcification associated with it. I'll just echo what Chuck said. We see a lot of echoes and aortas, and that, that one stands out. And if you haven't checked treponema pallidum in that patient, uh, we should. Just the uh, blood, right? Yeah. Do you, do you remember what they were? No, no, top of my head. I, have to, I have to. I have to double check it. Uh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. All righty. Okay. So uh, my third case. I don't know. Am I running out of time? A uh, 51-year-old um, 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 healthy female, um, except for um, uh, some history of hypothyroidism. Um, First-degree family history of uh, sudden death. Her dad actually died at age 40. With um, um, and, and he had autopsy, actually, and she was told that he died of some sort of arrhythmia. Uh, she presented with um, uh, frequent palpitations and presyncopal spells. Um, and she was admitted uh, in outside facility. She was found to have frequent um, uh, unifocal uh, PVCs and rounds of non-sustained VC. So these are uh, the telemetry, uh, telemetry strips uh, obtained from the um, outside hospital. I'll just go through frequent PVCs here, um, uh, non-sustained VC. And this is the 12 week ECG obtained uh, any volunteers, please?
That lead one is positive, so that's as much as I can tell on the EKG. Thank you so much. Plan. So where should we go next? Uh, more imaging, stress testing, make sure that she does not have any coronary artery disease in, you know, some way. Um, uh, go straight forward to uh, EP study. What would you choose? Let's start with echo. That's a good choice. <laughs> echo, I'll uh, just expedite things. Um, kind of limited a little bit um, uh, because of body size. Uh, RV may be on this image just a tad bit uh, dilated. Function looks okay on both. Doesn't look too bad on the uh, coastal image here. And then she was um, uh, scheduled to have um, exercise stress test. And almost after exercising six and a half minutes, this happened. All right. Dr. Saxena. Um, I was going to say that's her syncopal episode. Um, I don't see that there's AV synchrony anymore. It looks like there's AV dissociation. I'm trying to see if there's P waves all the way through. Is there a P wave right in front of the QRS? Yeah, maybe. So it looks I mean, like she developed AV dissociation. Yeah, or uh, that, that's true because there's a P wave and a junction. It looks like yeah. junctional break. And this is more of that. And uh, MRI. yes. <laughs> <laughs> And um, uh, this was the uh, next uh, modality. At this time, she was transferred to Abbott. Uh, we're getting advanced imaging. Dr. Lindbergh. Yeah, I mean, so this is the typical uh, free contrast SSFP. This is free contrast SSFP cinema imaging. On the left hand side, is the short axis, and four chamber, two chamber, and three chamber view. Uh, okay. The LV function, I think, can you play it again? I'm sorry. The LV function, I think, looks okay. Uh, on the limited images, the RV function looks okay there as well. So maybe low normal in terms of LV function, but Good. okay. And a couple of cuts of um, uh, delayed enhancement. Uh, so there's no LV delay enhancement. Uh, I would have to see a little bit more of the RV. Again, RV is tough to see because the wall is so thin uh, when I look at delay enhancement, but there the, I don't see any DEs. Yeah. Thank you. So normal, uh, structurally normal heart. Uh, she also went, we, you know, went ahead and uh, had a chronic TK uh, that was normal. Plan, increase beta blocker dose and send uh, her home, or um, should we do an EP study? Okay. Can I ask Chuck and um, Ryad if, if it is an MRI necessary in this thing with the ECG showing what it did and the echo being normal? I think so. I think uh, an echo is a great test to look for ARVC or something like that. I think the most important data that I still would want to know is the nature of her syncope. Um, even in patients with high risk of many things, um, the indication for things are usually unexplained syncope. So with that EKG and, and so forth, it sounds vague, because that would very much affect what we decide to do to her. If this is a scary syncope, somebody just dropped versus felt vagal, nauseated, um, even if the patient has ARVT, that can affect what we do or doesn't. Um, so, but the next step in my mind, other than that, is probably it's not a bad idea to put these patients on the treadmill. Um, you know, she's older than someone who would have something like CTVT or some, because you wouldn't expect, if this is a benign form of you'd expect them to go away at peak exercise and, and not see more, uh, um, polymorphic PVC or VT. So that's probably something I would do first. I clarified the story and put it on the treadmill. Um, Correct. Maybe that's the treadmill. Correct. That, that, was, that was the, was the exercise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 she did. So essentially, she did that, and the question is, you you not expect patients to vagal when they're exercising? Oh, so I thought that was a screening. Issue. Correct. Yep. Yep. So, but actually, I thought those ECGs were very modest because the first ECG you have nice voltage, broad T wave, uh, 
text reminds me of the famous left wing of the lab in Mallory called Broadway War of Change. And yet on that exercise test, now assuming that was during exercise and not she exercised for six minutes and then quit, that's very unusual because if, if that was a junctional rhythm or, or uh, if that was part, you were trying to demonstrate heart block, it, it was like the P waves vanished. I mean, everyone was looking, well, where are the P waves? Right. They, they weren't like the ones on the, on the first piece of the piece. So it, the, the tracings are, are, I would say, um, need better definition. I, I'm not sure I understand the, the nature of so just so that was a little bit troubling, for, you know, for us. So the only thing is that, in in terms of the story, it probably has happened immediately just after she exercised, and uh, because she started exercising, exercising the way she describes it, became short of breath, and the treadmill um, speed was decreased, and then in that immediate, just the post peak exercise period, I think that's what when the vegan, uh, 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 you know, experts happen. I think we, that's how we explained it, uh, uh, because it, it, it did not, that is how she explained it, but it was not the way it was recorded uh, on what the during It did not, it according to the patient, immediately, out. just in the immediate uh, post-exercise. Yeah. That's a curious thing. I don't know if you exercise, I thought that's screen, but there's a huge difference between doing this during exercise in the program mentioned, which you know, small B waves could be because there's a high legal form, that's a red slow, actually all the B waves with the ABs. There are a lot of things that can cause this, but there's a huge difference between post-exercise syncope and peak exercise syncope um, with whatever EKG it shows or doesn't show. Absolutely. Point well taken. Yeah. Looked at up until Correct. those EKGs, yeah. did she have normal sure. heart rate rise and um, normal blood pressure? Correct. None of them were uh, present during. Yeah, even after she came back on telemetry, she, it was not. All right. So, um, any volunteers? I may not even have uh, picked the right uh, the right spot, but. These sharp signals are atrial signals from the coronary sinus and you see VA kind of blank you back via dissociation, so it's it's VT, so that's pretty much all that you can say based on this. I've always remembered so always start with the surface ECG. And then this may be what initiated a PVT, I believe. And if there is more V than A, this is VT. And I think <laughs> this is what, uh, I think this is with the stimulation, but the same exact type of uh, ventricular arrhythmia was, was in this. Yeah. Any more comments? Yeah, so, so, this is I think a very, this doesn't look like typical RV output track PT in a normal heart. It's very slurred, notched, broad based, very close ears because it's positive in each one. Um, and in the other scalar ECG, although there was a QS that V1, there was also a small R in V2. So this is coming somewhere from the outflow, but it doesn't look. Usually outflows, VTs, and in, in, in uh, normal hearts are. Have a rapid uh, upstroke and 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 they're narrower. They don't look like. That's the technical thing. But if you basically see that VT after, you know, if it's the same morphology, are you insane? Are you are you? Have, I don't think you're really. Have it. If you look at the spikes and the relationship of the spikes to the RS, I wouldn't make any conclusion out of that. Anything that has no more text. Wow. Okay. So this is actually what it was um, um, uh, reported as, and actually was like a simple ablation, and um, after that it could not be um, induced. 
Um, I just wanted to kind of state that point about doing an MRI, what uh, Dr. Sharkey raised. Is, I mean, the major differential diagnosis is star-mediated reentrance. This is considered to be, a, at least considered to be a triggered um, activity uh, related and make sure that they don't have anything structural that, that, could, that could cause it and hence the need for more advanced, advanced imaging. All right. Yeah, I think this weird EKG post-exercise in the VT, is there a connection or not? If it only happens post-exercise, then in a while, the P-wave looks different because it's not a sinus P-wave would be it. So that, that I can easily explain that, potentially, uh, if it's post-exercise with a normal MRI. And I agree with Dr. Gorenstein. You know, sometimes the morphology of the BVT could be a challenge. Sometimes you can't tell whether it's stereo or VOT or VOT, but it was salvaged. Um, it's not clear, clear enough to enter behavior. Um, to me, it's root and then stops. That's more of a what you expect from uh, it. looks like the BVT didn't um, prepare on um, exercise. So I feel, com I mean, I want to clarify her family history. That's unrelated. But I feel comfortable if this was inducible, ablatable with normal MRI and some symptoms suggestive of neurocardiac etiology, that that's the end of that. I, I think that was the final I, conclusion. I, I, I have no part of the case, so I'm not defending any kind of it. I don't know. Just, just so really quick, though, when it comes to ARVC, uh, most of them do not have delay in cancer. And the, the way we diagnose ARVC is really based on criteria, it's based on volume, EF, and wall motion. And wall motion is usually obtained not under standard views, it's obtained based on what we call axial imaging. So you have to actually do a whole stack of imaging, cranial to caudal, cine imaging, looking for wall motion. So just the one we saw, the representative slide, that, that doesn't allow us to make the diagnosis of ARVC. Agree? I have more cases, but I'll stop here. Okay. Are there any other questions or any other discussion that you'd like to have? Eight o'clock? Okay, thank you very much. We have one more grand round till we have winter break. So next week will be the last week, and then we go till January 8th. And please stop by and thank Novartis and Jansen for supporting our grand round. <laughs>